Okay, so good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining uh, this press conference that we've arranged for today. My name is Stephen Allen. I'm the Executive Director of the Validity Foundation. Validity is an international non-governmental organisation that promotes and protects the human rights of persons with disabilities. We are headquartered here in Budapest, and the case that we're reporting on today has been a very important case uh, that we have been uh, litigating on behalf of the 220 victims of the top house institution just outside the capital city here in Budapest. I'm joined uh, by my uh, esteemed colleagues today who are going to give um, some reaction to a judgment that we have received in the case uh, yesterday. Um, to my right is Shamil Gurbai, Validity's Impact Manager. And to my left is Adam Kenya, who is a lawyer who is representing Validity in the proceedings um, that took place. Um, just a note that we're conducting this uh, press conference primarily in English, but we're open to questions in Hungarian if that's uh, needed, so please feel free to uh, provide your question in whichever language you would prefer. Um, so yesterday at the Budapest Capital Court, um, we want to report that after seven years of litigation, um, uh, there was a finding uh, that state authorities in Hungary are indeed responsible for the horrific conditions um, to which uh, 220 residents of the top has institution were subjected when we visited that institution in 2017. Indeed, in her findings, the judge found that the state authorities were responsible in those cases for violations on multiple grounds, including of the right to personal freedom, the right to human dignity, the right to habilitation and rehabilitation, the right to early intervention, the right to education, and the right to health. She found in her oral judgment yesterday that all of these amounted to discrimination on the basis of disability against the residents of top hands. Specifically, she found violations against the Directorate General of Social Policy and Child Protection, which now operates under the Ministry of the Interior, for their failure to control the situations that was occurring in the top house institution. She found violations had been occurred due to the inactions of the Pest County Office, um, and she also found uh, violations against the now Ministry for Culture and Innovation for also failing to conduct the monitoring that is essential in such closed facilities. That is a new ministry which previously, when we started this litigation, was the so-called uh, Super Ministry, the Human Capacities Ministry, back in 2017. And in particular, she criticised those entities for acting as passive observers in the face of very serious human rights violations. In Validity's view, Top has is symbolic of Hungary's system of institutionalization of over 20,000 persons with disabilities, many of whom are subjected to large scale, long term, lifelong detention. These institutions are closed to the public view. We know that at top has this dangerous combination of elements, the fact that the institutions are closed and that people are denied from complaining or access to justice has resulted in serious and ongoing violations. We're not alone in this. The United Nations recently have found Hungary in violation of its international obligations concerning the rights of persons with disabilities violations that the UN has called grave and systematic against persons with disabilities in this country. After raising our concerns initially in 2017, the government took very quick action, but not to provide support, reparations or rehabilitation to the victims. Instead, they fired the director and they outsourced the institution to the charitable order of Malta here in Hungary. That's a non-governmental organization that runs many social services. Ever since 2017, the Order of Malta have kept the doors of Top Has closed. They have closed it to independent monitors of validity, and they have denied our repeated attempts 
to represent and provide legal representation to the victims in that institution. And today we are calling on the Order of Malta to open the doors of top hands. Indeed, we also call on the government of Hungary to open the doors of all institutions in this country. We know that there are serious problems inside both state-maintained and NGO-maintained institutions, and it is essential that independent civil society, including validity monitors, are allowed to access these places and assess the situation. Now, in her judgment yesterday, the, the judge gave oral remarks and has found violations of the right to protection from discrimination for the victims therein. But for us, declaratory relief like this, a declaration is simply not enough. The victims of these abuses in the top has deserve much more. They deserve compensation. They deserve rehabilitation. They deserve reparations. And indeed, as all of the persons with disabilities in this country deserve, they deserve the right to live in the community. It is our view that the institutions in this country will continue perpetrating violence and abuse against persons with disabilities until they are closed. One final remark before I hand over to my colleagues on this case. The institutional system in Hungary is funded in large part by the public budget and control by central government ministries. But Hungary also benefits from hundreds of millions of European Union funding that have, has been used both to renovate these types of institutions and indeed contributes to the ongoing deprivation of liberty of children with disabilities and adults with disabilities in violation of international human rights law. We are not today calling on Malta or the Hungarian government to improve conditions. This is not enough. They need to finally, in order to restore the right and dignity of all persons with disabilities, ensure that all can leave immediately now, today, with the support they require to be reintegrated into Hungarian society. So the Hungarian government and the European Union need to take these steps. With those opening remarks, I'd now like to give the floor to my colleague, Chandor Burbay, impact manager, to my right. Chandor. Yes, thank you, Stephen. Um, so as Stephen said, yesterday, the Budapest Metropolitan Court delivered a uh, first instance decision um, um, in uh, judgment um, in our case, which we brought against the Tokhaz institution, which is located uh, very close to Budapest. And um, it houses uh, 20, uh, 220 persons with disabilities, including children, adults with disabilities. Um, Stephen mentioned that uh, state authorities were found responsible for human rights, serious human rights violations in this institution. And uh, we should mention that these authorities, including like um, uh, the Child Protection Authority, including the former Human Capacities Ministry, including the Pesh County Government Office, uh, they had a role to manage and supervise and control the functioning of this institution. And they either, according to the judgment's decision, they either didn't do this, um, um, didn't monitor the functioning of the institution, or if they did, they acted, acted as passive observers, uh, uh, which means that they were aware of human rights violations in the institution, but they did nothing in order to protect children and adults with disabilities and they didn't do anything to bring them out of the institution and provide them with uh, community-based services, and in case of children, with families where they can be brought up. Um, Stephen Orst also mentioned the serious human rights violations which happened in the institution, but uh, we should mention that institutionalization of children and adults with disabilities is a widespread uh, problem and human rights violation in Hungary. 
the government's response uh, to human rights violations is that they bring out persons with disabilities from big institutions to smaller institutions, meaning uh, that they uh, house persons with disabilities in small group homes, which are often called in Hungary protected housing. Uh, the name of this uh, facility is very tricky because we, uh, or supported housing, because we could imagine that in this facility, persons with disabilities rights are, are, are respected. But the truth is that in these many institutions, uh, persons with disabilities rights are still violated. And uh, in, in the so-called deinstitutionalization process, in Hungary is about this, is about trans-institutionalization, meaning that bringing persons with disabilities out of big institutions and housing them in smaller ones. Um, so currently, there are more than 20,000 children and adults with disabilities are living in institutions, many of them in big institutions, which means that they, uh, these facilities are housing more than 50 uh, persons with disabilities. So currently, there are more than 16,000 uh, uh, children and adults with disabilities are living in, in such a big, uh, in such big institutions. And the other 3,500, 3, they are living in small institutions. But uh, uh, statistics show that uh, the Hungarian government is not advancing the rights of persons with disabilities. They are not creating community-based services. They are, I mean, even if these are created, persons with disabilities are um, uh, um, detained in these big institutions, and during the day, they are going to receive uh, daycare uh, services, again, segregated daycare services, and they are going back to the institution to spend the night there. Um, but uh, we should also mention that Hungary came up with the first deinstitutionalization strategy in 2011, like more than 13 years ago. And in between 2013 and 15, they managed to uh, roll out from big institutions like uh, more than 600 persons with disabilities. And after that, Hungary was very slow with the deinstitutionalization process. And again, just I need to highlight that uh, this deinstitutionalization process meant that they uh, housed persons with disabilities in smaller institutions. And currently, as I mentioned, still uh, uh, more than 16,000, uh, uh, 1,600,000 uh, people, uh, sorry, 16,000 persons with disabilities are living in big institutions. Um, just to give an example, like uh, there is a uh, big uh, town close to the border with Austria, uh, and this town called Sombathel in Hungary. Um, there was a, a big institution which housed 150 persons with disabilities. The Hungarian government decided uh, to make this institution, I mean, to, to rename it and open it for older persons with disabilities. So many persons with disabilities were brought out of the big institution and were housed in uh, the garden of uh, another institution, which was close to Sombat Hay. They built up four group homes for like supported housing facilities in the territory of a big institu institution for older persons, and they put or transfer persons with disabilities to these small institutions. Uh, other persons with disabilities were still like housed in small group homes in the territory of Sombathei, and older persons uh, were moved to the big institution for, per for persons with disabilities. Uh, this is how the Hungarian government is uh, proceeding with the institutionalization processes, and this is the process uh, which is happening now in, in the top house institution, which is now called the House of Providence in Gert, where uh, these serious human rights violations happen and are still happening, just not in the big institutions, institution, but in smaller ones. Children are still denied 
the right to education, they are still denied the right to habilitation and rehabilitation, adults are still denied the right to uh, access to, uh, to, to, to work, and they are still denied to be able to decide on their own because many of them are deprived of their so-called legal capacity, so they have guardians who decide for them. So human rights violations are still ongoing uh, in good in the former Tokas institution. Thank you very much, uh, Shani. Um, I'd like now to give the floor to um, Adel Kenya, who has been um, an excellent litigator on this uh, very, very important, very, very challenging case. So, uh, well, actually, um, thank you, Stephen. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we brought this case to the court. Uh, this case was brought as an Actio Popularis, as a public interest uh, litigation, which is an instrument in Hungarian law, which allows NGOs to act on their own name without having the affected victims participating in, like, in this case. So this uh, kind of uh, instrument, this litigate, public interest litigation, uh, provides a protection for vulnerable groups who would be unable to pursue litigation themselves. And not only because they do not, do not have the money for a lawyer or do not have the knowledge how to uh, bring a case as such, which lasted seven years just in the first instance, but uh, I think there is another, or a, there's a different obstacle that they are facing, and I'm going to give you a little bit uh, of an example of why I think they have no access to justice or uh, uh, at all. Um, I remember we were sitting uh, at the office of the director of uh, Topaz, a uh, new uh, maintainer, the Matics, with Stephen and other colleagues of validity, and in front of us there was a young. A lady who was completely were able to communicate with us clearly, clearly and she asked for our help. She wanted us, she wanted me as a lawyer to help her. The director prevented her to sign the power of attorney, which was already uh, printed out and it was on the table. And uh, why she did that, the director said the reason was because the guardian was not present. Uh, at that time, and without the uh, guardian, she cannot sign such a paper. Uh, the residents of Top House cannot act on their own. Their legal capacity uh, is limited uh, by the court, which means that they cannot do any action without the guardian or the legal representative, even if they are kept in such an inhuman and degrading conditions uh, which was now proven by the court. Um, as I mentioned, she cannot sign the papers because the guardian was not present. But it took validly years of litigation to get access to the names of the guardians uh, of uh, Topaz resident. So, so, she didn't, so they didn't provide us with the content details or the names of such guardians, but we had to do another litigation but just to get access to this information. I think this brief example gives you an idea how people are living in these large space institutions like Top has and in many others that Shani and Stephen was already mentioned that are operating in Hungary just now, and they do not have access to law and justice. Um, this lawsuit has also shown or proved how this how the system of guardianship is dysfunctional in Hungary as well, because we uh, learned that 30 or 40 residents uh, are uh, uh, dealt by one guardian, which means that there could be no meaningful link between the guardian and the residents. So these guardians, uh, by the number of the residents they have to deal with, just cannot uh, operate meaningfully. It was also uh, proven in the lawsuit that uh, Top has official representative for the residents, right? There is a person there, has not complained about the gross violations that we have proven in Top has. So all in all, there is no protection. No one is protecting the most vulnerable persons from the oppressive and torturous treatment of the public institutions. And uh, specifically, yesterday's oral, del oral delivery of the judgment, the judge said 
that we only had assumptions of what's going on right now uh, in this uh, institution that is now run by the Maltese, because we couldn't provide any hard evidence on the ongoing violation. And she also added, and I think this is very important, and Stephen already highlighted it, because we were not allowed to enter the institution. We were not allowed to go through uh, all the works that uh, we were able to do uh, um, previously when validity to those horrible pictures and videos. We were not able to do right now. And that was the reason why, we, why uh, the judge didn't, uh, didn't impose any consequences, uh, any real remedy uh, on the institutions that are not in NATO as or the predecessors. Um, and it was very true because despite repeated requests, we were not able to enter. And I hope that uh, yesterday's judgment will be hope to all the individuals and their families living in a closed institution and will encourage the state to take action to ensure that what happened in Tokaz does not happen as well. And the first step should be to allow NGOs into institutions for people with disabilities. Thank you very much, um, Adele. Um, a couple of final remarks, if I may, um, as I've been listening to my colleagues, and I think it's important to reflect on. Some of the people whose images became, um, at the time, um, very well known here in Hungary back in 2017, some of those people have died subsequently. And we actually don't know how many, because that information is not often made public unless we take serious actions to gain public information. We have one case under Article 2 of the European Convention on, on Human Rights on the Right to Life pending in respect of one individual that we met who wanted to help but who subsequently died and soon there will, we are expecting, be a judgment from the European Court of Human Rights on this very important case. Secondly, I want to address the point uh, in Hungary about the ineffectiveness of the current regulatory and monitoring system. These are the monitoring of closed institutions are pre presided over by a number of state authorities, including the Social Affairs and Child Protection Directorate, uh, which now operates under uh, the central ministries. Top has isn't the only case where there are problems. There are problems, as my colleague has mentioned, in numerous institutions across the country. We also know that the National Ombudsman, the Defender of, uh, the defender of Public Rights, the Public Defender of Rights, excuse me, um, simply has no capacity to meaningfully and consistently visit these places of detention. That problem will get even worse if Hungary continues going down the path of building more closed and small institutions. It's the wrong policy. It means uh, uh, that, that there is going to be no meaningful opportunity to identify the types of violations we now know existed in the top has institution. Finally, Validity is a non-governmental organization and have taken this litigation for many, many years um, at our own cost, with no cost, of course, um, to any of the victims we have sought to represent. Nevertheless, yesterday in the Capital Court, the judge did order some costs against validity, and that's a substantial amount of costs against a number of ministries who, she said, were not directly responsible for the violations. Now, I want to make a point here about the inc incredibly important role of public interest litigation. Ordering costs against independent non-governmental organizations who are seeking to bring to justice cases which obviously uncover serious, serious human rights violations, including torture and ill-treatment, in my view, is unacceptable. It limits the possibility for independent civil society to, to play our crucial role, which is to blow the whistle when there are problems and to call attention to decision makers who need to make to take a stand. So we will be looking at the final written judgment, which we expect to be delivered um, by the judge from the Capital Court within the next 15 days. We do not yet have 
a written judgment. But I will say to you uh, that it is very, very likely that Validity will be seeking to appeal many aspects of that judgment, and this is not going to be the end of the story. Indeed, our sole objective here is to ensure that every individual victim receives the full range of redress and reparations which are due to them. And we will continue with our legal efforts to ensure that there is accountability for the awful situation that has occurred in Topaz. So with those um, remarks, I'm now happy to open the floor to questions. You may make your question in either English or Hungarian, which is your choice. If uh, you do in Hungarian, we'll also interpret into English with the uh, support of my colleague, Jofie, here. Um, if you could just identify yourself when you uh, give your question, please, and then I'll, um, uh, we'll, we'll seek to address them. So the floor is open. Questions, please. Thank you. Yes. Alex, so the British freelance journalist. Um, uh, you mentioned that uh, the, at the relevant time, uh, the um, battle was uh, within the uh, Director General or within the purview of the Director General of the Human Resources Ministry and that it's uh, and the other competent authorities, if they were aware, uh, seem to be completely passive. Um, how uh, uh, how far do you think that um, awareness of problems at Top Haas uh, and at other um, related institutions percolated in the Human Resources Ministry? Did, did it get to state secretary or ministerial level? Thank you very much for the question. Um, I can say personally, we know that that was uh, at the highest levels. So um, Zoltan Balo was certainly aware, state secretaries were certainly aware. Um, indeed, we had um, uh, uh, official statements made to the BBC at the time from senior government ministers. So they were not just aware of the general situation, of the general problems, they were personally aware of the serious violations in the Top Hands Institution. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? And there's also mm -hmm. online. I'm also online with mm -hmm. my colleagues who are monitoring. So, no, no, please go ahead, Daniel. Um, yes. Um, could I uh, just uh, get uh, something clarified? Um, so, if I've been slow to understand, um, uh, uh, this is a first instance judgment after seven years since the initial. Uh, so the activation of this process, um, uh, how how has such an extraordinary time delay come about? What are the procedural reasons that have been given for such an extraordinary time delay? Thank you very much. Um, and uh, may I ask you to address that? Thank you. Yes, I think it's a very good question, and it's also a question for us. How is it possible? Uh, there was actually an interim judgment in the beginning. Uh, it's, it was whether it was more of a procedural judgment was about whether validity has the right at all to bring, uh, bring forward such a case. It was debated by the ministries. So yes, obviously this uh, caused a little bit of delay because the second instance court uh, ordered the, the first instance uh, court to continue the litigation. So it was clarified in the beginning. Even though after the active popularity, it's, it's, it's well established. Yeah. Yes, yes. The reason, the, the argument by the ministries were that we cannot uh, take forward such a case because it's a closed institution and the law says that the larger group should not be, know the size exactly the affected people and it's a closed institution. You know, so we know, but we referred back to the uh, Roma education cases where it was obviously uh, uh, clarified earlier, even by the highest courts. But uh, we uh, uh, we also uh, submitted official complaints for the delay uh, in the litigation because I think it's questions whether it is uh, if it's an effective remedy at all uh, because we are uh, looking forward for appeals, a second instance decision, and even a courier, so it will take two or three more years, actually. So uh, I'm not uh, completely sure that 10 years of litigation in such a case uh, could be uh, said to be effective at all. Thank you very much. I mean, of course, Validity is a specialist legal advocacy organization, and Hungary is not the only country that we work in where we see serious barriers to persons with disabilities accessing justice. Um, but in cases of egregious human rights violations, 
It is worrying that it has taken so long to receive even a first instance decision in this case. I should note that it wasn't our only attempt. We also attempted to initiate criminal investigations in the case in the Top Haz institution, and those were dismissed by police and prosecutor authorities, finding no uh, criminal complaint to proceed with. And of course, this was a complex um, set of circumstances, but extremely well evidenced. Um, uh, and so it shows to us, I think, that there really is a lack of routes of, for access to justice for people, even those who have um, experienced uh, the most incredible violations at the hands of the state. Now, I see online we have um, uh, a few people. Um, I see Nick Thorpe, so could um, Nick, we're gonna try and turn on your mic. Okay. Um, can you hear me, uh, Stephen? Yes. yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this um, opportunity in this press conference um, about this shocking case. I wanted to ask uh, Stephen, what similarities or differences do you see with the recent scandal at the uh, orphanage at Bichke? And the prime minister and the government, I think, have promised some kind of investigation as as to how into, I think, the way the directors of institutions uh, like the one at Bichke are appointed. Do you see any signs of hope that because of the sheer scandal, firstly, what you have revealed at Topaz, but also most recently in much bigger publicity over Bichke, that there might now be a reassessment, a general reassessment, at least at governmental level, but perhaps by society, about the fate of, you know, as you say, more than 20,000 people with one disability or another in Hungary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, uh, Shania, I might also bring you in on this one, if that's okay. But um, yes, um, we are aware of the parallels with the current um, um, outcry concerning the bitch care institution. Um, actually, um, bitch care is one um, institution, again, that has hit the public headlines purely because of a quite serious scandal, and, and particularly the work of independent civil society to raise awareness of these topics. So in our view um, and in our experience, these issues are simply not being addressed unless civil society ourselves, we are strongly calling it on to the violations we see. But the truth, the truth is, and it remains the case today, the validity and many other independent NGOs, including those who are members of the National Child Rights Coalition, we don't have the right to access these places. Despite the fact that they are publicly maintained or supported institutions, they are effectively closed. They are closed in terms of the doors, which are locked, residents cannot leave, and even though we make repeated requests to enter such places, often those are denied. So the first point I want to make to say is that it is uh, there are obvious parallels in the Bechka institution um, and uh, what's happened in uh, Top Hands. One of which, um, of course, being that the um, oversight and independent monitoring has been completely insufficient to identify problems that should have been identified earlier. A second aspect actually is the very functioning of the Social Affairs and Child Protection Authority. Um, frankly, in my view, there needs to be not just a public investigation into individual scandals like this, but the very formation and functioning of the state authorities who are charged to maintain these institutions. I don't have personally much confidence in the current authorities and we don't think that a limited scope investigation will be uh, su sufficient, indeed, uh, to address the problems that have occurred. Um, do I hope for a general reassessment of government policy and perhaps public opinion in these cases? So we know after Bitchka broke that there was a huge public outcry, rightfully so, and similar was the case in Top Hats. But actually, we should all address our minds to those countless other institutions holding children and adults with disabilities that are not making the press and where there is no one going in to see what is happening. 
Indeed, a limited investigation into what happened in Bitchka isn't going to deal with that. We need a fundamental overhaul, both of the independent monitoring framework, but also the social policy in this sphere. Maintaining institutions, building new institutions, investing hundreds of millions of euros of funding in these institutions, all that's going to do is put paper over the cracks. It is not going to address the fundamental problem, which is that adults and children, and particularly persons with disabilities, are denied their right to live in the community. It doesn't matter how beautiful the cage is, it will still be a cage, even if it's made of gold with European taxpayers' money. And so we are actually urging not just um, uh, accountability in these individual cases, Nick, to your question. We're actually arguing for a change in government policy that recognises that we can't continue to have tens of thousands of people locked in these places, often for life. Shani, would you like to say something about the 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 links between these these questions and what we hope? Yeah, sure. I I would like to mention um, is that of course there are similarities. Um, uh, what I would mention is, but the judge uh, said explicitly in uh, her decision in uh, in our case against Stophas that these state authorities uh, acted as passive observers. So they were aware of the human rights violations which happened in, in Topaz, but they did nothing. Or like they perhaps visited the institution, but they didn't react. They didn't uh, protect the rights of persons with disabilities. And the um, Director General of Child Protection, I mean, Social Policy and Child Protection was one of them. The, as as um, the former questions, uh, the previous question uh, was about that, whether the Ministry of Human Capacities, how far the ministry was involved, they were involved in both of these cases, in Bichka and in Tophaz as well, and the uh, Pest uh, County Government Office. All of these three um, state authorities have the role to supervise uh, the management of the of the top has institution and also to monitor the functioning of the institution and to protect the rights of children and adults with disabilities. What is shocking that they did nothing. And that was the same in Beach Cat. Of course, those uh, state authorities uh, were aware of the human rights violations which happened in, in the child care uh, institution. But they did nothing. They were like in this case, they were passive observers. And uh, uh, in my eyes, this is just uh, a, a, a a really gross human rights violation when uh, when state authorities are aware of human rights violations of children or of persons with disabilities, and they just do not act. They do not uh, fulfill their role to protect the rights of, of, of these people. And uh, so this is a, a uh, of course, a similarity. And I think uh, so many institutions uh, can be found in Hungary, either in the child protection uh, uh, system or the social care system or in the health care system, which are facing the same problem. That those state authorities which are responsible for monitoring the functioning of these institutions, they are they are not doing their job. Just let me add something. I, I find another similarity, uh, which obviously relates to what Shani said, that uh, in both cases, the victims uh, of the violations uh, were, were not remedied, they were not compensated, not re rehabilitated. It's very, very similar in both cases that those children in Bichka uh, was not uh, uh, given any uh, uh, compensation or any uh, help or support after uh, these horrible um, crimes were revealed. And in Topaz, uh, the revelation by validity dates back to 2017. This is where there were a huge public outcry, but 
nothing happened despite uh, except that the directors were removed that's not something that remedies the situation and we needed to go to the court and still we don't have any kind of remedy so i think the uh, the most important similar similarity in both cases is that the victims the children who were affected were not given any kind of compensation whatsoever Thank you very much, um, Adele. Um, I know we've got one. Uh, I just there's a question here, and then I've got, we've got a couple online. So maybe I'll take this question. Okay. Thank you. I just have a remark. I have proven empirical experiences from my own that what you said that state authorities are passive observers. I would go a little bit further. They are complices, complices, not passive observers, and doctors are misusing their academic honesty, misusing their Hippocratic oath, and labeling innocent people with false diagnosis and validating uh, them, the, the harassers. That's all. I have proven evidences to say that. Thank you very much. And we, we certainly know of uh, problems, not just in social care institutions, I should say, but also in psychiatric facilities in Hungary that are also very, very closed, where high levels of physical, mechanical and chemical restraints are employed, often with very limited or no judicial oversight, even though the rules are relatively strict on that. Um, so I think we would share many of those concerns. And, and we also know, of course, that the St. Gotthard Institution, a massive psychiatric institution on the border, also with Austria, um, has incredibly serious allegations that came out publicly recently, not just about the conditions therein, but also, I think, the, the, the whole range of, of violations exactly that occurs in that place. And, and we know that people cannot even meet their family members to get complaints out. So th this is uh, another symptom, I think, of of the closed nature of the institutions in Hungary and the fact that persons with disabilities, in fact, have very few avenues to challenge that. Um, I'd like to take two questions we've got from online, so just read them out, um, and then we'll take uh, um, some answers from all of us, I think. So the first is from uh, Rita Crespo, who's from the European Network on Independent Living. She asks, has the European Commission reacted to this case? in light of the reports about the investments of EU funding into institutions in Hungary, um, which maybe I'll ask you to take if, if you don't want first shunning. And then secondly, maybe this would be for you, um, Adele. This is from Anna. The friends and relatives of persons still staying in these institutions are probably very worried and concerned with this news. What do you suggest they should do to support people inside these inaccessible places? As individuals and as a group, what rights and mechanisms do they have to protect the rights of their family members and relatives? And I think it's an important question. Shani, could I ask you to come in first on the European Commission? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> of course, the uh, European Commission is um, is aware of the uh, of the Hungarian government's approach uh, to these big institutions and to the process of, of the institutionalization, um, which means that, uh, as I mentioned, persons with disabilities are just transferred from big institutions to small institutions. And the Commission knows about that because um, the directive has played a role in this. So we send them the report, the House report, and we also let the Commission know about several um, the institutionalization processes started in Hungary, in which the government aimed to uh, trans-institutionalize persons with disabilities. Uh, the Hungarian government spent a couple of uh, hundreds of millions of Hungarian foreigners of these processes. And the uh, commission, I mean, they, they didn't intervene. Uh, there was, uh, one uh, one call uh, to for the institutionalization in Hungary, which was suspended, but then again the money was used to launch another uh, call for the institutionalization, which was just finished. 
uh, at the end of uh, 2013, last year. Um, and this money, this huge amount of money, was spent on creating these small group homes, or for renovating big institutions, for refurbishing them, and to bring persons with disabilities to these small institutions, which are very often um, um, located uh, at the edge of the of the towns or, or the villages, or very close to the big institution, or even in the territory of the big institution. And uh, uh, so persons with disabilities who are placed in these new facilities, they are still segregated from the society. And during the day, either they are just staying in the group home or they are going back to the big institution, going back, which is again, I read traumatizing, and they are working in so-called shelter workshops which are in segregated settings. So they are spending all their time in these segregated settings. And uh, the money uh, uh, which is coming from the EU is spent for that. For it, the, the EU money is spent for, uh, this, uh, for disability uh, based discrimination and segregation. And the commission knows about it. Thank you very much, uh, Shani. And I suppose it rests with me to say that if the European Commission knows about it and the European Commission continues financing it, our view is that the European Commission must hold some accountability, not just for the mistakes it has made, but also preventing ongoing use and misuse of European public funding um, on actually incarcer a system of incarceration of people with disabilities in this country. Um, indeed, Validity also has legal actions concerning the European Commission, seeking information on precisely what it knew, when it knew it, and what steps it has taken to address violations, um, uh, not just in top hands, but also in terms of building these new institutions. And to date, I have to say, we are concerned that Brussels is not taking this seriously enough, despite the large numbers of people affected and the large quantities of public funding at play. Adela, did I ask you to talk about to the second question, which yes. was concerning the, the concerns of parents and families? Yes, I'm not so optimistic about the situation there because uh, what we found is that families do not have access uh, to the institutions as well, so they, they will not see for themselves the living conditions uh, their relatives are uh, in. So this was the case in Topaz as well. Relatives might visit the residence, but in a separate room, which is designated for visits. So these uh, uh, families whose uh, relatives were uh, in Topaz, uh, in many cases, were not aware of the situation that the uh, validities are uh, faced. So uh, my advice would be, obviously, uh, in any case, you would have such a, 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 a suspic suspicion that uh, uh, something is going on, uh, something is not right, you have to make a complaint in writing. Uh, normally, I would suggest return to the police, but as uh, uh, Stephen uh, spoke about earlier, even in top hat case, originally first we turned to the uh, the police to issue criminal complaints, which uh, which was long before we issued the, uh, this uh, public interest litigation. So that was our first step uh, to 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 provide uh, evidence for the criminal authorities, but we failed. And not because we didn't provide enough information, we provided the very same information that were, were uh, found by the civil court value and uh, resulted in this judgment yesterday. But the criminal authorities did not investigate properly of complaints. So this is something uh, that families might face again. Uh, so that's why I said I'm not very optimistic, but in all cases, uh, uh, the clients turn to me, I suggest you have to do it in writing. You don't phone, you don't uh, complain, uh, uh, and, for, uh, and with the um, caretakers, you, you do it in writing, then you launch a complaint, and you ask for the assistance of NGOs who might be able to help you. 
Thank you very much, Adele. And just to say, I mean, we, we don't apologise for how we represented the violations that we, um, we uncovered in 2017. The reality is that the, the, under international human rights law, uh, many of the incidents that we reported amount to torture under international law. Not just maltreatment and not purely neglect, but the severity of harm, the long-term neglect in itself can have such a profound effect on a person's life that it absolutely causes the same level um, of pain and suffering that any victim of torture or more classic forms of torture um, will experience. And, and validity is crucial for us that there needs to be, of course, action in every single case, including criminal punishment where there is uh, people responsible. Shania, I know you want to come in and then we'll take a last round of questions. So Yes, thank you, Stephen. I just would like to come back to the question on, on uh, similarities between Top House and Beach Cat for a while. Because um, it was mentioned that uh, uh, um, victims were not provided with habilitation, rehabilitation, financial compensation. But I would like to add something to that. Under, again, international human rights law and under the redress and reparation framework, um, state is also obliged to publicly apologize yeah. for these gross human rights violations. So we want to call on the Hungarian authorities to publicly apologize for these serious human rights violations which happened in Topaz and in Bicca and all the other institutions in Hungary falling under uh, the healthcare system, social care system, and the child protection system. So publicly apologize for these serious gross human rights violations. Thank you very much, uh, Shani. So um, I'll just check if there are any final questions. Um, yes, please. Uh, please. Yes, sorry, I'm just again. Um, this is sorry, a question that as we're coming to part A and part B, my apologies. I'm just slightly confused about the question of access to the uh, institution. Um, uh, validity had that access in 2017 and not thereafter. Uh, was it that um, the transfer to the Order of Malta changed the legal status of the institution, made it possible for you to get access, or was there some um, other change in Hungarian legislation that blocked your access thereafter? I didn't quite understand that point. And secondly, the UNHCR, the UN in 2020 report, um, did they visit Popaz specifically? Did they have access? Yep. So thank you very much. And I also see Nick has his hand up again. So if we take also his question and then we'll address them together. Nick, please. I think we're unmuting you. Okay. Can you hear me again now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it was just a clarification about the role of the ombudsman. I yeah. think you perhaps Adele mentioned that the ombudsman does not have the capacity. Could you clarify, is the ombudsman not taking a sufficient interest in your view, or does the ombudsman not have a budget for this, or could you just clarify that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, Adele, could we come to you first? Do you mind if, um, just talking to the access question and whether the change to Malta was the proper problem? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, um, and validity accidentally had the access to go through all the rooms where we were able to you know, surface the violations. We were there before in this separate room where uh, residents were able to you know, see the family members, the visiting group. And I was not there when Stephen had the uh, uh, ability to go through. Uh, but obviously, after uh, the evidence is the report, uh, was published by Validity, uh, we had no access whatsoever. We tried many times uh, to get into the institution when the parties came into picture, and we had this one meeting that I was talking about, and we had this actual person, this resident who seek uh, our help, but that was the only occasion we were able to go there. And even throughout the lawsuit, uh, Maria Herzog, who is a well-known expert on, on child protection, testified in the case and actually asked uh, the lawyers of the parties to grant her access so she can 
she can go through, uh, but it never happens. So uh, I am not aware of any kind of uh, independent monitoring visits from the side of civil society. And regarding the Ombudsman, uh, we used as an evidence a uh, report of the Ombudsman, which dated 2017. So it came out uh, after uh, when we did this uh, uh, report, uh, which was, uh, uh, which was I think, a good report. And, and the judge based uh, her decision partly on the findings of the Ombudsman as well. But unfortunately, after 2017, we did not have such a total report, right. such a total visit. Uh, so I don't know exactly the reasons for that, but I think my colleagues can have made this another insight. Yeah, uh, Shani, do you want to come in briefly? Um, sure. Um, concerning the Ombudsman's role in um, in visiting uh, institutions and um, and issuing um, re um, like um, reports on these visits, um, we should keep in mind that the Ombudsman has limited capacities, uh, and um, also what is important that civil society organizations, including organizations of persons with disabilities, unfortunately are not involved in these monitoring visits and in the writing of the report, although that would be an obligation under international human rights law to uh, include persons with disabilities and their representative organizations uh, whenever the homeless person, when he's acting uh, under the uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities as a monitoring body, body to involve persons with disabilities and their representative organizations. And uh, unfortunately, in 2022, the ombudsperson was downgraded from A status to B status, which is quite indicative of, of the ombudsperson's um, commitment of the human rights of uh, specific um, 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 groups of yeah, like people. So, so to be clear, the Ombudsman agreed with us on what happened in Top Hats in that circumstance and following our publication of the report. But actually, the quality of the Ombudsman's monitoring has been um, under question for an extended period of time. They see no problem with supporting the building of new institutions, for example, with public funding. I saw a press release even this morning about another institution that the Ombudsman is supporting um, to be built. That is in direct violation of Hungary's international commitments, direct violation of Hungary's obligations under the European Union. And it's the wrong position for the Ombudsman to be taking. So we also have real concerns and I, I have to be honest with you about the independence of the Ombudsman, particularly in cases that cause a lot of public interest. I think in the case of Top House, the report was important because it confirmed many of the findings that we had already made public. Um, but today that institution is not operating with the same level of independence. And it's also why in our view, there has to be open access to all closed institutions in the country by independent civil society. Because if the Ombudsman is not doing the job or can't do the job, and it's probably a combination of the two, then really it is independent human rights organizations like Validity who are the sole organizations left who can raise awareness of what's happening inside. And after the 20, as you'll know, the 2020, you mentioned the UN 2020 report, now, the UN 2020 report um, looked not just at the situation in top hours and to, but to the question, we, we are aware that the investigative team from the United Nations visited top hours and saw uh, themselves the situation inside. That's now public information as well. Um, so, um, of course, that formed a part of their conclusions about how institutions in Hungary operate and their eventual conclusion that Hungary is in grave and systematic violation of its obligations under international law. I want to dwell on that point for one moment, because this is not saying that something has gone very badly wrong in one case, in one institution. 
This is that Hungary is failing to uphold its minimum essential standards under uh, obligations under the convention. And those minimum essentials mean that persons with disabilities have their legal right to make decisions acknowledged. Uh, Adela said that many of people with disabilities can't even initiate complaints when they are victims of abuse. And that's because Hungary has this guardianship system and that really affects tens of thousands. I think it's typically 60,000 people even today, Sean. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we know that's not changing even since the 2020, 2020 report. Secondly, continuing to maintain places like Top has, whether by the government, main, uh, with the government maintaining it, or the Order of Malta maintaining it, is a violation of the right for people to be included in the community. The old paradigm of keeping people in big, locked institutions must end. And frankly, the United Nations has been clear about this consistently. The European Union has been inconsistent on this and is allowing these, these financing agreements to continue. And unfortunately, independent authorities like the Ombudsman here in Hungary seem to have little awareness of what the topic is really about. So for us, um, it's a problem of interest, it's a problem of budget, it's a lack of independence, and quite frankly, it is the low um, credibility, I guess, or the low levels of public interest um, in the rights of persons with disabilities in Hungary, which all those of you who are here today, we, we ask you to help us to get this message out, because very rarely will the victims of Top House be heard, if ever, unless we make these attempts. I'll, I want to make one final call. Uh, it's to the um, current uh, director of the Charitable Order of Malta, Miklos Vece, who personally rejected Validity's requests to access the Top House institution during the ongoing litigation on behalf of the victims. Miklos, I'd like to speak to you. We want you to open the Top House institution now. If, as you claim, things have changed for the better, it's very important that independent human rights monitors are let in. I would, of course, reiterate the same rule in respect of government institutions in this country that continue to be maintained by the authorities. So unless there's any other final questions or showing you anything you'd like to add, I know. Um, we're going to bring this um, then press conference to a close. I'd like to thank you all um, for attending. Um, there is, of course, um, a public statement available on Validity's website now, which we published yesterday. Uh, when the uh, written judgment is handed down, we will, of course, do a follow-up briefing for, for everyone. And we'll keep you updated on our plans um, to pursue appeals, in this case, against those parties uh, that we were unsuccessful against. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.